I hope you guys enjoyed this episode brought to you by our sponsors at Athletic Greens. To receive a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase, visit athleticgreens.com slash impact theory. Enjoy the episode. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Conversations with Tom. I am joined today by somebody that I've been waiting 30 plus years to speak to, the legendary astronomer, Alex Filipenko. Alex, thank you so much for joining me. Well, Tom, it's my pleasure and my honor. You know, you've done so much to impact people's lives in a positive way. You know, I've watched a number of your programs. It's just been fantastic. And you and I share a number of aspects of our lives in that, for example, we like to set goals, we like to be efficient, work hard, be motivated, know why it is we're motivated. And so what you say to people resonates very much with what I've, you know, how I've conducted my life and how I try to inspire people as well. Wow, man, thank you. For somebody who was on one of the teams, I think there were 50 of you that essentially won the Nobel Prize. I know it can only go to three people. Um, but that you were on that team. That's incredible, man. Thank you. You obviously have very useful <laughs> goals. So um, yeah. very excited to to sit down and have this chat. And hopefully the next time we do it, we'll be in person. That would be amazing. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is, you know, weird circumstances, but I know that in the past year, you've had a lot of practice doing these, um, you know, Skype interviews with people and they worked out really well. It, it's almost as though I'm there with you in person. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, the technology is a saving grace. And when I think about the fact that this wouldn't have been possible, if this had happened back in, you know, 2010, like this wouldn't have been possible. So, uh, right. you know, there are a lot of times when this could have occurred and been just disastrous, even more so than it's been now. So uh, for that, I will I will certainly tip my hat in gratitude. So. Uh, yeah, technology Absolutely. has brought us together. And here's something, in fact, that a lot of people may not understand about astronomy. And I was saying before we started rolling that one of the things that um, I was once asked what I would be if I wasn't an entrepreneur, and I said an astronomer. And huh. admittedly, that um, is is accurate in terms of how astronomy makes me feel. I'm way too bad at math to actually do it. Um, but there's something about the the grandeur but the way that it's usable. And when I heard that um, the theory of relativity was necessary for GPS to work, that's when I was like, wow, there's a lot of things that we have around us that we take for granted that actually have to do with physics and people looking up at the stars. And I wanted uh, to start with yeah. what you mm -hmm. teach in your basics of astronomy class. You say there's like four or five things that you want people to yeah. learn. And if they don't learn, you're gonna come back and fail them, You know, even if it's yeah. 20 years deep in their career. What are, right. what are those handful of things? Yeah, you know, one of them is that, as Carl Sagan used to say, we are made of star stuff. And by that, what he meant was that the heavy elements in your body, the carbon in your cells, the oxygen that you breathe and that's in water, the calcium in your bones, the iron in your red blood cells, the phosphorus in your DNA, all those heavy elements were cooked up through nuclear reactions deep inside stars during the course of their normal evolution, and also when they explode, some stars explode. And this debris goes flying out and mixes with other clouds of gas, gravitationally collapses, forms new stars. They then go through the same process of what we call nucleosynthesis and then stellar explosion, et cetera, et cetera. And after billions of years of evolution, our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, had these clouds of gas that had a sufficient quantity of heavy elements that rocky Earth-like planets could form. And then somehow, somewhere, you know, bacteria formed, little singular cell organisms formed, and through billions of years of evolution, here we are, sentient beings that can come to understand the process of our origins, the origins of the very elements of which we are made. If that doesn't grab you, I don't know what will, right? That we're made out of atoms that were literally spat out of exploding stars. Yeah, that one's interesting to me for a couple of reasons. One, it gives you a sense of um, the sort of Star Wars moment of a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, that there were, that we've sort of come along so late 
that stars formed and collapsed and exploded, populated, you know, other places. And then we ultimately come out of that. It really gave me a sense of like what 13 billion years really is. Uh, oh, yeah. What an extraordinary amount of time. Um, well, the other it thing, one gives it a it gives it a purpose to the universe, right? If the universe had only inanimate objects like rocks and stars and things like that, black holes, it wouldn't be able to think about itself and reason through how it all came to be and how it evolved. In a sense, we are the way in which the universe has found to know itself. And you know, there may be others. I don't know, but. We're the only ones, the only sentient beings with this capacity to ask and answer abstract questions. And that's just a marvelous thing. How do you contextualize that? Like, is it poetic for you? Is it religious? Like, how do you make sense of that? Yeah, you know, it's some combination of poetic, religious, spiritual, for sure. Uh, you know, we all try to find meaning in our lives, and there are many ways one can find meaning. But one way that I've found is to contribute in some small way, hopefully a large way, but at least in some small way, to humankind's understanding of the cosmos, of this amazing and magnificent universe in which we live. And one thing I try to do in my semester-long course at Berkeley is to show students not only the magnificence of the universe and its contents, but that through this process of careful thinking, observation, experiments, we can come to and have been coming to a pretty good understanding of how it all works. There are a lot of things we still don't understand. Absolutely. New things continue to be found. I mean, as a scientist, it would get boring if there weren't new unexplained things to continually answer. That's why I'm in it. But we also understand a lot as well. And you know, a testament, a testament to that is the fact that we can build airplanes and rocket ships and pacemakers and, and these electronic devices through which we can talk no matter where we are in the world, right? That's a testament to the success of science. Yeah, it's it that when so I'm not a religious person, but when I Think about the relationship between the cosmos, sort of how vast it is and how much there still is to understand. And yet, through the things that we've discovered so far, how we're able to shape the world around us, I'm obsessed with this idea that skills have utility. And there's a, another way to say it would be knowledge has utility, insights have utility. And getting people to understand you don't read a book to check you know, a box on a list. You don't go to college to impress your parents. You don't even look at the stars just to say that you can. It's you're getting data back from that. And that data then lets you do something. And one of the like you talk about wanting to have an impact on people. One of the things I want people to get is like. When you learn about something, you then can build a bridge erect a building, create GPS, travel to the stars. Like it, it that fills me with wonder. It feel, fills me with a sense of agency. And if you begin to tell yourself the right story, then it becomes also meaning and purpose. And like, that's the juice. And it's so crazy. Like when you look at the stars, what do you feel? I, I feel basically all the things that I just said, and I have such a hard time putting it into words, but what do you feel when you look up? Yeah, no, actually, I think you expressed it quite eloquently. Uh, you know, I feel a oneness with the universe, that I'm part of this grand structure that evolved over 13 or 14 billion years. And here I am, a small subset, as far as we can tell, um, that that can strive to understand it, you know, and I don't have to be the one who makes the discoveries. You know, I'm an astrophysicist, but I gain joy in learning what biologists have, have determined. You know, the, the, the Human Genome Project, CRISPR-Cas9, all these advances that can be amazing for the benefit of humans, but also just intellectually so provocative, so enthralling, so awe-inspiring, right? that we are these creatures that can come to this understanding. And, you know, going back to something you said at the very beginning, you know, general relativity was this weird theory of warped space and time that some crazy hair, you know, theoretical physicist, you know, Albert Einstein, of course, dreamed up. 
Fast forward 50 years and even 100 years, actually, and here we have GPS, which with all of its military and commercial applications, that simply would not work if you didn't take into account the warping of the passage of time, depending on where you are in a gravitational field. And an even better example is quantum physics. You know, a century ago, physicists who were thinking about the world weren't interested in making a better toaster or, or improving cars or whatever. There were two major questions, understanding the nature of light and understanding the existence of atoms. And you might think, well, those are just, you know, intellectual titillation. It doesn't really matter. But it does, because fast forward a century, and today's micro world, the half a billion transistors at the head of a pin, basically, right? Moore's law, all that, that's built on an understanding of the quantum world, the nano world, you know, these little seven nanometer pixels that are now infiltrating electronic devices and, and storage units and stuff. That was all an unanticipated spinoff of sort of blue sky wondering about the world and our place in it and how it works. So, you know, that's the best of both worlds. We satisfy our intellectual curiosity and we do things that are for the benefit of humankind. Yeah, it's a great way to look at it. Um, as you were talking, it made me remember something I've heard you say in interviews before that um, as your wife knows every now and then you sort of wake up in the middle of the night screaming that we may know nothing. Like, th like th there might be some huge revelation coming that will show that we're sort of as both brilliant and ignorant as somebody like Newton, right? Who couldn't have conceived of what was to come and yet gave us these tremendous breakthroughs. Do you think, because when I, I can sort of grasp <laughs> the big concepts of astronomy, uh, but when it gets down to the, to the quantum realm, I start freaking out in like a really fun way, but like the double slit experiment in, um, in physics, quantum physics, particle wave, look at, don't look at, and things change. Like that freaks me out in a way that I love so much. And in science, you often talk sort of the, the miracle, the, the axiomatic part you get down to where it's like, you, you just have to trust that this thing is real. Do you think there will ever be a point where there's sort of no more miracle to get to where we know like what the vacuum is made of? Or like, I'm not even sure how to ask yeah. that question. Do we ever uh, find the base? Yeah. It, it's a great question, Tom. It's something that scientists and in particular physicists struggle with all the time. The short answer is probably we'll never have such a theory. And the reason is, is that science and in particular physics is not so much after the truth with a capital T, reality with an uppercase R, but rather a description, a quantitative description that allows us to explain quantitatively the results of experiments that have been done and to make predictions about the likely outcomes of experiments that have not yet been done. To the degree that we can explain what's been done and make predictions that then get verified, we pat ourselves in the back and we say, we have a pretty good working model. But we never know whether there will be some experiment in the future that does not conform with the predictions or expectations of our model, of our description. In that case, it'll have to be modified, sometimes in small ways, other times in fundamental ways, like Einstein's relativity, which was a completely different way of, of looking at Newtonian mechanics. Mm. And then the quantum world, you know, that, that deals with the very small. And you have general relativity that deals with the very large. If we someday have a quantum theory of gravity that's well verified and tested and explains situations where there's a lot of mass in a small volume, we may pat ourselves in the back and say, hey, this is working. We have the final theory. But who's to say that some, some young whippersnapper someday won't find an experiment that doesn't agree with that? And so a new modification will have to be made. So it's always a description, a model within the context of what our brains have ca are capable of constructing. It's unclear whether this is the underlying reality, right? Yeah, that, that question to me is um, too tantalizing to leave alone. And I'm not sure why I find it so interesting 
because certainly somebody like myself is never going to um, make use of that knowledge. It's just not what I've aimed myself at. Um, but there is something magical to Einstein's question of, I want to know God's thoughts and everything else is just details. <laughs> what do you think about that? Like, I think he had a, a comp, well, as we look back on his life, I think we have a complicated relationship to what he meant by God. Um, he may have had a very clear relationship, but what do you think about a sentiment like that? Do you find that equally intriguing to you? Is that just not worth pondering? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's an interesting question because, you know, there are books of Einsteinian quotes. You know, there's like a thousand of them or something. He's a very quotable person. And there's a, remark a remarkable number of them in which he brings up God. And this has led many people to think that he was a deeply religious person in the classical sense. It's not true. It turns out that his God was what's called Spinoza's God. It's sort of the God that that is nature, that explains sort of, you know, the ways in which the natural world works. It's sort of the God of the natural world. He did not believe in the classical God who's sort of, you know, watching over things and maybe even, you know, influencing them along the way. So when he said he wants to know God's secrets, I interpret that to mean that he wants to know really to the degree possible, what are the fundamental laws, quote unquote, for laws, because even he admitted that these are all just descriptions and models. But nevertheless, the farther down the path you go, the more complete you think your description or model is, because it explains and is consistent with more and more observed phenomena. And so we begin to think of it as being the reality. Even if deep in our hearts, and of course I didn't know Einstein, but I speculate that deep in his heart, he probably would have admitted that this isn't necessarily the reality. It's just a description that happens to work really well. Mm -hmm. And for example, in a quantum theory of gravity, you don't even have curved space time. You have these little particles called gravitons that are zipping back and forth between say earth and the sun telling each other that we're here and for the earth to be gravitationally attracted to the sun. And same thing with the moon and the earth. Whereas in his theory, he thought of it as being the consequence of a curved space time. But that's just a description or a model that happens to lead to calculations that can be done relatively easily and whose outcomes can be compared with things like the orbit of the moon or earth, okay? But again, it's just a model, it's just a description. And I think he understood that that's all it is, but was hoping that through the end of this process, we will someday know the final theory, even if he perhaps didn't think that that was ever really truly possible. There's a lot of interesting things around there. So um, one, the reason I said that I've been waiting, whatever, 32 years for this interview is when I was a kid, I was just unable to wrap my head around the idea of an expanding universe, which I know is one of your areas of expertise, because I just kept thinking, all right, hold on. If you expand a city, you expand it into the areas that are forest or whatever. There was something there. If you build a house, yeah. there was land there before you built the house. What is the universe expanding into? Even as you get into gravitational waves, right? Like you imagine this thing going up and down, what what's below it? What was above it? Like, I, I even now I'm like yeah. I don't understand. How, what what are we expanding into? Right. So here's where I like to use analogies. All right. Um, first, to answer your question, there are two ways of answering it. We aren't necessarily expanding into anything, and I'll clarify that in a minute. Or you can think of it as expanding into a fourth spatial dimension. So we have X, Y, and Z, okay? This would be a fourth dimension that we can't see, we can't touch, we can't experience. It's mathematically describable, but physically inaccessible, okay? Can we, so before you move on, can we describe what you mean by physically inaccessible? Are you saying that, hey, we've got eyes, ears, touch, they, we have an umwelt, we have right. confused that umwelt with all things. 
And once you get beyond our sensory perception, because that was one thing I struggled with a lot until I came to understand sort of David Eagleman's idea of you're just a Mr. Potato Head and you could read magnetic signals, but we don't have those receptors. A shark, you know, can sense magnetic uh, or electrical movements. So you can actually trick a shark. I still can't believe this is true, but I've seen the footage. You can put a, a plate on the floor of the ocean that has an electrical current that mimics the electrical current of a flopping fish, an injured fish, and the shark will just sit there attacking the plate all day long because it's actually picking up on the electrical signals. That made me realize, whoa, like there is a lot of data that we just can't perceive. And so, because I know what you're about to explain, uh, is that what you mean by we can't perceive it? It's, it's beyond even that sort of perception. You know, the shark thing, if we had the right sensors and scientists have done this, this is how they know, they can detect those signals, even though with our eyes, we cannot. But there's all kinds of, for example, electromagnetic radiation, light that our eyes don't perceive, you know, radio signals and x-rays and stuff. What I'm talking about are actually other dimensions. So here's where I like to use an analogy and, you know, a piece of advice I give to people to clarify your ideas with an analogy when you can. So I'm going to, I've got this balloon here. All right. I anticipated this question, Tom. <laughs> and so I'm going to suppose that this is a hypothetical universe where you're constrained to be on the balloon, actually more technically within the rubber itself, and you can only go forward and backward, left and right, and any combination of those two motions, okay, along the surface or, or through the balloon. The laws of physics prevent you, light, or anything else from going into the balloon or out. Okay. By do you, is there a known mechanism by which we are stopped? Well, in this hypothetical universe, no. I'm just asking you to suppose it's okay. so. I'm in our you. universe, the mechanism would be that all the particles, light, protons, electrons, are restricted to the usual X, Y, Z dimensions in this room. Okay, and we're still trying to figure out why. In string theory, the reason is because every particle is a vibrational mode of a little package of energy called a string. And the ends of the string are tied down. They're anchored to this X, Y, Z space, okay? But whatever the mechanism, you're restricted, in this case, to only being within the balloon. Now, the balloon can expand, and I forgot to bring my little stickers, but in my classes, I put little stickers on this, and the stickers move away from one another. And if you imagine a sticker is a galaxy, like our Milky Way, you would see the other galaxies moving away. Each of them thinks they're at the center, but none of them is in the unique center. The unique center is the center of the balloon, right? Mm. But that's not part of the universe as I've hypothetically defined it. The universe is only the balloon. The center is in a mathematically describable but physically inaccessible dimension. And so too is the expansion. I blow some more, not too much, otherwise I'll get a little bang, uh -huh. a little bit of nerd humor there. <laughs> but it expands into this dimension that we can describe very easily mathematically, okay? The R dimension in polar coordinates. But the dude in the, in the balloon does not experience the R dimension, outward or inward. They only say we are at R equals six centimeters or whatever it is, okay? They know about R extending farther outward and inward, at least mathematically they know about that, but they can't actually go there or see it or anything like that. So in that sense, now take our three-dimensional universe, think about a three-dimensional sphere, not the inside of the sphere, but something that wraps around a fourth dimension. We're expanding into that fourth mathematical dimension even though we can't see it or even conduct any experiments, unlike the shark case, 
that show us that it's there, okay? Does that clarify things a little bit for you? That is extraordinarily transformative in my life, and I, I actually mean that literally. I now know why you have won so many teaching awards. But now, <laughs> what you've done is simply give me the next question to ask, which is extraordinarily powerful and what a gift, right. but now I'm gonna ask it, and let's see where we go. Yeah. So the part about string theory um, really helped with the breakthrough in that there's something that we don't know yet that there's some force, I'm gonna use my language and if I misspeak, please stop me, but there is some as of yet unknown force that is anchoring us within the rubber of the balloon. And that's really important for anybody who's not watching to, to think about the universe being only that layer of rubber and your entire yeah. life is within that layer of rubber. And there is a force as yet unknown that keeps us in that layer of rubber, make sure that we can only see within that layer of rubber and even detect only within that layer of rubber. So now my question is, what, what is that like? So the R dimension, and this is using analogy. So I look up at the stars, I have this sense of wonder and awe and it triggers in me. And I don't know how much you um, know about sort of the other side of my life, but I actually write. And um, Impact Theory is meant to be a film, TV studio, the whole nine. And I'm always drawn to science fiction because it you get to play the, well, what if it were like this game? And one of the analogies that I find just absolutely exhilarating is, uh, and I had somebody tweet me uh, this question to ask you, is in Men in Black, at the very end of the first one, they do this pull out, pull out, pull out, pull out until you zoom out far enough of our universe to realize that we're really just a marble in an alien universe and everything that we think of as is the universe in existence is, you know, this actually really, really small thing. And this idea of bubble universes where we're, there's some greater, which still doesn't answer the question of what, but, you know, there's some greater thing holding this foam of bubbles and every bubble is a universe. Yeah. That to me is, I want that to be true so badly like there's just something about the, the just it's so big and so unknown. Now, let me anchor sort of where I'm going. I read once that gravity becomes where everybody in the um, physics and astronomy community pay attention because it's the one sort of mysterious force. And all the other ones make sense, but there's something about gravity's too weak, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Can That's you right. explain that? Right. So there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, it's not the right <laughs> questions, you know. You, you should clone yourself and become an astrophysicist, all right? <laughs> oh, I'd have to get a lot better at so, math. So first of all, yeah, the idea of multiple universes has now gained real respectability. I mean, card-carrying physicists, astrophysicists are thinking seriously about the possibility because we could discuss this later on, but ideas about how our universe was born and evolved with time naturally lead to other pockets that are essentially independent of ours. And so there could be, you know, a gazillion of them, or there could be an infinite number of them. Okay. So I'm, you know, I, I like that idea a lot for a lot of reasons. Now, getting back to your specific thing about gravity. Yeah. If you look at the four fundamental forces of nature, there's two nuclear forces that keep the constituents of protons and neutrons together, and they keep protons and neutrons together in a nucleus. That's called the strong nuclear force. Then there's a thing called the weak nuclear force, which sort of keeps the neutron together in a sense. Then there's electromagnetism, which keeps the electron and a proton in a hydrogen atom together. And then there's gravity, which keeps us to the surface of Earth. When you look at these four forces in terms of their natural strengths relative to one another, Gravity is like 38 orders of magnitude, 10 to the 38 Whoa. power weaker than these other ones, which, you know, they're not all exactly the same, but at least they're comparable to one another. But gravity is like 38 orders of magnitude weaker than electromagnetism, which is to say that the electron and a proton in a hydrogen atom feel essentially no gravitational force. They are completely and utterly dominated by the electromagnetic force. Well, a big question is why is gravity so weak? And one idea is that although the particles I described in string theory are these little open-ended strings that are tethered to the rubber that we just talked about, 
The carriers of gravity, these gravitons, are thought to be loops, and they can escape from this rubber balloon and go floating off into that other dimension, which is called the bulk, B-U-L-K. This is like a membrane, a brain in the bulk, and there are other membranes elsewhere. But if most of the gravitons are floating around in the bulk, then there are not many of them in the membrane that is our universe. That's one idea of why gravity might be so weak. And so those, those gravitons would actually be having an impact in our membrane or no? Um, not really, except that the corollary of what I just said is that gravitons from other universes in this bubble theory could reach and get into our membrane. And that might be one way of testing for the presence of these other universes, which at this point are completely speculative. It's an interesting idea that seems to fit well with a lot of our other ideas, but there's not a shred of direct evidence for these other universes. But this might be a way of finding that evidence if someone were to someday directly detect gravitons and find some way of figuring out whether they came from our piece of rubber or some other piece of rubber somewhere out there. I don't know how you would do that, but it's within the realm of speculation at least. Is anybody asking the question around whether we could ever, like us as a whole human being or even with an instrument, but sort of rip through the membrane and exit out into the, I forget what you just called it, but that the, other space, the what, the bulk? The bulk. Yeah, so has anybody speculated? Can can we theoretically cross into that region? Yeah, um, great question. Black holes, which are regions of space where matter is compressed so much that nothing, not even light can escape, okay, can be thought of as rips in the fabric of space-time because they end up with a singularity, either infinite density, that is, you know, a finite amount of matter in zero volume, or if you bring in quantum physics, maybe it's just a very, very high density, you know, but not infinite. But in any case, it's definitely a, a weirdness in our otherwise smoothly varying space time. And the equations even suggest that on the other side of the black hole in our universe, it opens up into another black hole in one of these other universes or in a very distant part of our universe. And so if we could find, well, if this is true, this hypothesis, and if we could find a way to hold the throat of the black hole open so that we could safely pass through, there might be a way of actually uh, experiencing that is getting into, or at least getting information from these other universes. Again, this is highly speculative, but these would be essentially rips or wormholes in space that give us access to other universes. Very highly speculative. Now this is, this is the stuff I, I absolutely love. So let's play with the speculation for a minute. So um, one, there's a few things around this I've always been super curious about. Forgive me for asking sort of rudimentary questions. What is it about, so you talked about the throat. So I know there's um, probably a gravitational effect that as you cross the event horizon, it would just rip you apart because your, your toes would be more impacted by gravity than your head. And so you would just literally disintegrate. So I understand that. But um, what then, if we, were, we talk about opening the throat, are we somehow stopping that, that gravitational um, discrepancy? Like what, what do we mean by holding it open? Yeah, okay. So the effect you're describing uh, of being ripped apart is affectionately known by astrophysicists as spaghettification. <laughs> nice. Because you get stretched in the long direction and squeezed in the, you know, along your width. Uh, that actually happens for a relatively low mass black hole, maybe 10 times the mass of our sun. It indeed happens outside the boundary, the so-called event horizon of the black hole, and you'd get ripped apart. But it turns out for gigantic black holes, a billion times the mass of our sun, like the Does ones that, that exist? are- Does that exist? Yeah, pardon? 
that exists? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, in April of 2019, just two years ago, the Event Horizon Telescope team showed using a bunch of radio telescopes on different continents, they showed this amazing picture of a black hole in another galaxy, actually the silhouette or the shadow of a black hole. Since no light comes out of a black hole, you can't actually get a picture of the black hole. But this is the silhouette of a black hole. And it's in a galaxy called M87, 55 million light years away, which means it took light, you know, 55 million years to reach us. But that corroborated the evidence we have from other lines of reasoning and measurement that these black holes really do exist in the centers of galaxies. And our own Milky Way galaxy has a black hole roughly 4 million times the mass of the sun. And that was, in fact, that discovery was recognized with the Nobel Prize in Physics just last year in 2020 to two colleagues of mine, Reinhard Genzel here at Berkeley and in Germany, and Andrea Gaz, a colleague of mine at UCLA. Her team and Genzel's team showed really clear evidence that our Milky Way galaxy has one of these so-called supermassive black holes. So for the supermassive ones, you actually don't get ripped apart just outside the event horizon, the boundary. You get ripped apart when you're closer to the singularity, to the middle. But regardless, the worst ripping apart and then squishing together occurs at the center, the singularity. So by holding the throat open, I actually mean preventing the singularity from existing and squishing you. And along the way, preventing the gravitational forces from first ripping you apart. You got to do all those things. You got to be not ripped apart and then not squeezed into an infinitesimal point almost in the singularity. So you need something with a negative gravitational effect, like negative mass. And that's invoking the tooth fairy right now. Because <laughs> again, maybe someday someone will figure out a way to either find this stuff or make this stuff. So it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. And I always like to be, you know, forward thinking, you know, not everything is possible, but some things that have not yet been proven to be impossible might be possible, although very, very difficult, you know. That is intriguing. So uh, the singularity, for people that don't know that, um, when we get into the math, because I can give you a lay person's explanation of it's the point beyond which we can no longer predict what happens. But what is the math saying? That it's infinitely dense? Yeah. So what's called classical general relativity, which doesn't include quantum effects. So it can't be anywhere close to the final word. OK, nevertheless, you know, classical physics, Newtonian physics has served us well. General relativity through GPS has served us well, blah, blah, blah. The classical prediction is that no matter how much matter you throw into a black hole, it all squeezes down to a mathematical point. Now, a mathematical point has zero volume. R, the radius, is zero. So R cubed, you know, the volume is zero as well. So that means an infinite density, mass per unit volume. Um, so no matter what you throw in, you'd get squished to an infinite density. Again, none of us really believe that because all other times when we've thought about nature on sufficiently small scales, we've had to introduce quantum physics. And so it is thought that the next big thing will be a quantum theory of gravity. Uh, and, you know, Hawking made steps in that direction. He tried to unify quantum physics and general relativity. But even if we don't get squished to an infinite density, no doubt we'll be squished to a very, 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 very high density unless we find some sort of anti-gravitating material that can preclude the formation of the singularity and the associated deleterious effects on our existence. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, so I'm going to keep asking ignorant questions because uh, I feel like I'm sort of making progress in my layman's understanding here. Uh, okay, so we're worried about getting squished down way too small. When I heard you describe that it, it has infinite density, as a lay person, it sounds like I may have accidentally come to the same conclusion that 
That's sort of the only thing we can rule out. We know it can't be infinite density. Is that what gives birth to this idea of on the other side of the black hole, there has to be something spitting things out? Because yeah. otherwise it just seems like it, it uh, and again, I just don't know anything about this, but it doesn't seem like you could infinitely shove every quantum particle down into uh, uh, something with zero radius, right? Like something, yeah. it seems like something has to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, by the way, your, your questions are perfectly reasonable. And this is a very abstract, you know, mind bending topic that a lot of people are interested in. And so I get the same kinds of very good questions over and over again. So they're great questions, okay? So the idea of it spitting out the other side, or at least opening up into a black hole the other side, doesn't come from the impossibility of infinite density. Yes, we don't know how to get an infinite density, but let's just suppose you could, okay? The mathematics still opens up to another black hole. And it's just because- Can, I, can I stop say, you there? So, Because I didn't yeah. understand it the first time, but I just let it go. So if it's opening up to another black hole, isn't yeah. that just something also sucking things in? Yes, but from the perspective of something that went in on the other side, it can come out. So if it- if Is it that goes, Hawking radiation? Yeah, well, yeah, um, well, that's related. I'll get to that in a second. If it goes into a black hole in our universe, it can't come out of the same black hole in our universe, but it can come out in a different universe. It's called a white hole in that case. Okay. Do we have white like, holes in our universe? No, we've never seen one. And this is why a, a number of us think that this is just a theoretical speculation and that there are no real such objects. Okay. Because you can't throw, you know, keep the throat of the wormhole open or whatever. It, the white holes would be very obvious. They would be things that are squirting out lots of matter. They're very powerful. They're very obvious. They're not hard to find like a black hole that doesn't emit any light. These things would be super obvious and yet we've never seen one. So, but, but at least theoretically, it's a possibility that even stems when you have um, the theory with an infinite density. The infinite density is okay. It's just that you have a mathematical solution to the equations that gives you another universe. Now, often in physics, we get solutions that, you know, have a positive and a negative sign. So let me give you an example. S suppose I construct an experiment with a pendulum or something that gives me the mass of an object, a paperweight. And I tell you the, the square of the mass, Tom, is 100 square grams. And then I ask you, what is the mass? What would be your answer? If the square of the mass is 100 square grams, the mass is? You, uh, 100 squared. If it's not that, I have no idea. You have no idea how much math is a black box to me. So, so it's this, you know, 10 squared is 100. So the square root of 100 is 10. Okay. Perfect. So you'd say the mass is 10 grams if the square of the mass was 100 square grams. Okay. But an equally good solution is negative 10 grams, okay? Uh, and by the way, when you squared it, that was an, an easy mistake to make because the way I phrased it, I now see it was ambiguous what I meant. I promise so you I it's not, was, not your fault. This, no, no, this but, is a... Yes, but I, what I meant really was not to take the square of 100, but take the square root. So that was an easy thing to make. But the point is, is that the square root of 100 is either negative 10 or positive 10 grams. So we throw out the negative 10 gram solution as being unphysical, right? It's meaningless. So the mass of your paperweight was 10 grams, not a very good paperweight. I should have taken a, a different example, okay? A little ball, ball bearing or something. But we throw that out as being unphysical. Well, you know, who's to say someday someone won't find something with negative mass? Maybe they will, maybe they won't. So in the case of black holes, a solution to the equations is this black hole or white hole in another universe. But we don't know whether that's a physically meaningful solution that nature actually chooses to adopt 
or whether it's just a mathematically um, possible but physically irrelevant solution mm -hmm. like the negative 10 grams currently seems to be, at least to me. But again, maybe someday someone will find what the negative 10 grams is, you know. And there have been examples of this in the history of physics. A physicist named Paul Dirac, about a century ago, combined Einstein's special theory of relativity, where the speed of light is the maximum speed, with the fundamental equation of quantum physics called the Schrodinger equation. He came up with something called the Dirac equation, the relativistic Schrodinger equation. And out popped a particle that looked pretty much like an electron, which has a negative mass, but it had a positive mass. And at first he thought this was unphysical, but then he said, well, why don't you, know, why don't you people look for it, experimental physicists? And they looked for it and sure enough, there it was. They found the, ne the positive electron, it's called a positron. So, um, you know, there have been cases in physics where the initially ridiculous looking solution or possible mathematical solution turned out to be something that corresponds to physical reality. But there have also been cases where we've not found a physical counterpart, the white hole being among the things we've never found. Another example is particles that travel faster than light. In special relativity, that's not impossible. They're called tachyons. They're traveling always faster than light, and to slow down to the speed of light would take an infinite amount of energy. Well, physicists have been looking for tachyons for decades, and they've never found them. Maybe they don't exist, or maybe we just haven't found them yet. We, we don't yet know. Mm. See, so we're exploring all these interesting mathematical solutions to see if they correspond to physical reality. Does that help you out? Very much so. And so now I have a, a question. Tell me why this is wrong. So as you're describing it, and obviously I'm existing in the abstraction layer of analogy, but as you're describing this white hole and my, my um, you know, whatever, just the way my brain works, the sort of leap it makes when I think about a black hole just sucking in all this stuff, all this stuff, all this stuff, all this stuff. And you tell me that the math says that there's sort of a, a black hole on the other side of that, but it would really be this white hole. It makes me the leap my brain makes is, oh, well, on the other side is a white hole is essentially the Big Bang. So you cram on one side all this stuff into a black hole, cram, 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 cram. And then it reaches some the theoretical, I have no idea what, you know, math it has to hit, but it hits some point and now it has to eject. And so what we think of as a white hole, we, we literally our entire universe is said white hole. Yeah, that's a very profound thought, actually. Uh, there are fundamental ways in which the mathematics of a finite universe, now, by the way, there might be infinite universes, but the mathematics of a finite, what we call closed universe, like the 3D example of a balloon, is very similar to the mathematics of a black hole. Nothing can ever escape from this finite volume, this universe, mm -hmm. just like nothing can ever escape from a black hole, okay? It's just that it's an expanding universe. It was born for reasons we don't yet understand as an explosion. But in a similar way, you can actually have a black hole within our universe that initially is expanding. Later on, it'll go kawunk and it'll collapse, but you can create an initially expanding black hole, no problem. So in many ways, the mathematics is similar. Our universe can be thought of as a black hole. The fundamental distinction is that in our real universe, a black hole is an object, a structure, where you've compressed the matter within this room, for example, and the black hole exists within the room. That's different from the whole universe being the black hole. Do you see the distinction there? It's kind of subtle. A black hole in our universe versus the whole universe being a black hole. There is a difference, but mathematically there are a lot of similarities and there have been theoretical physicists who have been exploring that idea of our universe as being in a sense, the ultimate black hole. Yeah. Oh man, this stuff is so interesting. And the, I, I struggle with one idea, which is you can be anything you wanna be, but not everything. 
And right. it really, really bothers me that none of us will live long enough to see all of the answers. Um, but when I start thinking about the the notion of Einstein sort of in the later years of his life being trapped by his own ideology and really struggling with the consequences of some of his own theories, um, that gets really terrifying. Talk to me about how, so even in this conversation, I form a notion and then you'll say something and oh fuck, that notion crumbles apart and now I have to form a new notion. How do we stay open-minded enough so that as you get more advanced in your career, you have deeper wisdom, you have more sort of threads to pull on, but you're also more likely to have woven a false tapestry that traps you. What do you do to be open to that new information? Yeah, yeah, it, it's, um, this, is a, this is a disease that afflicts quite a few scientists, theoretical physicists like Einstein, who become very set in their ways. I mean, Einstein was a real revolutionary when he was young. He was thinking of all these ideas that other people thought were crazy. Uh, and his weakness later in life was that he became so wedded, as you said, uh, to his tapestry that he wasn't willing to accept new ideas. And the fundamental idea that he was not willing to accept was quantum physics. Ironically, because of his many gigantic breakthroughs, that's the one for which he actually won the Nobel Prize for an explanation of something called the photoelectric effect. That's a quantum effect. He explained it, won the Nobel Prize for that, not for special relativity, not for general relativity, and yet an inability to come to grips with what quantum mechanics was trying to tell us about nature was his fundamental problem while he was trying to come up with a theory of everything. It really didn't have quantum mechanics. So we have to take those historical cases and keep them front and center in mind. Work hard at maintaining an open mind so you don't get fossilized, so you don't get set in your ways. And I would say that experimental physicists and observational astronomers such as myself, I'm not a theorist, though I like theory, we don't fall victim to that as often as the theorists because we get better and better with time in some ways. An experimental physicist learns more mistakes and how to avoid them. So does an observational astronomer. We build upon our past experiences and thus are able to do our jobs in many ways better with time. But the true blue sky thinking theorist has to watch out for this affliction and consciously work at keeping an open mind. Yep. Let's talk about Athletic Greens, the all-in-one daily drink to support better health and peak performance. With so many stressors in life, it's difficult to maintain effective nutritional habits and give our bodies the nutrients it needs to thrive. Busy schedules, poor sleep, exercise, stress, or simply not eating enough of the foods that your body needs. That's where Athletic Greens can help. Their daily drink is like nutritional insurance for your body that's delivered straight to your door. Developed from a complex blend of 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients, Athletic Greens is a greens powder engineered to help fill the nutritional gaps in your diet. Athletic Greens continues to obsessively improve this one holistic formula based on the latest research, producing 53 iterations over the last decade and counting. It's lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, and contains less than one gram of sugar without compromising on taste. So many people on our team at Impact Theory are talking all about their experiences with Athletic Greens. They love the taste and how they can get the micronutrients from various veggies without having to cook or buy groceries. So when our marketing associate Chase is busy and he knows he's not gonna be able to easily eat any greens, he can bring along Athletic Greens and make sure that he's still getting adequate micronutrients from the powder without having to eat an entire farm's worth of a salad. So whether you're looking for peak performance or better health, covering your bases with Athletic Greens makes investing in your energy, immunity, and gut health each day simple, 
tasty, and efficient. So whether you're looking for peak performance or better health, covering your bases with Athletic Greens makes investing in your energy, immunity, and gut health each day simple, tasty, and efficient. And right now, Athletic Greens is doubling down on supporting your immune system during the winter months. They're offering our audience a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five travel packs with your first purchase. Simply visit athleticgreens.com slash impact theory. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash impact theory and get your free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs to day. All right, guys, give it a shot. Take care and be legendary. All right, let's talk about the thing that trapped Einstein. So I know the thing that he really pushed back on is what he called spooky action at a distance. Um, can you describe that for people? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's the essence of quantum mechanics uh, and very, very spooky. <laughs> In special relativity, Einstein showed quite conclusively, and this has now been uh, verified with thousands, if not millions of experiments, that no material particle with non-zero mass, okay? A photon, a carrier of light has zero mass, by the way, it travels at the speed of light. But no particle with non-zero mass can reach the speed of light, let alone exceed it, because it would take an infinite amount of energy to do so. And as I said, you know, Large Hadron Collider, the Stanford Linear Accelerator, Fermilab near Chicago, all these accelerators have validated that concept over and over and over again. It takes a huge amount of energy to get particles going at close to the speed of light. We can't get them to reach the speed of light. The problem in quantum physics is that if you create a par two, pa two particles out of one, and let's say that that first particle wasn't spinning at all. There's, uh, you know, particles can spin sort of like tops. In quantum physics, it's a bit more complicated than that, but just think of it as spinning. If the particle originally isn't spinning, but then you create two particles, one of which is spinning clockwise and the other one counterclockwise, as seen from above, let's say, spin up and spin down. Quantum mechanics says that until a measurement is made, you don't know which way the particle, this one, is spinning, up or down, clockwise or counterclockwise, or this one. And it's not just that we don't know, the particle doesn't know. <laughs> and what that's really saying is that the particle is a quantum superposition of both spin up and spin down. It's both states simultaneously until a measurement is made, at which point it has to adopt one of the two states by a process that in quantum mechanics is still not well described. It's not described, for example, by the Schrodinger equation. It's a bit of a mystery. Nevertheless, once you make a measurement, spin up, let's say, the other particle has to be spin down instantaneously in order for them to cancel out and be spin zero. That means the other particle learns as quickly as you want, instantaneously, that a measurement has been made on the first particle. But that appears to be information or you know, a substance, a particle traveling faster than the speed of light. I forgot to say this, but a corollary of Einstein's that no particle can travel faster than light is that more fundamentally, no information can travel through space faster than light. That's a very important part that I forgot to say. But here it looks like information about the measurement of this particle reached this other particle essentially instantaneously. That violates the fundamental result or consequence of special relativity. Einstein called it spooky action at a distance. He never believed it. It's called the Einstein Podolsky Rosen paradox because he wrote a paper with two of his postdocs or something. And you might say, well, so far I've only described theory. What about experiments? Do they ver validate this? Yes, they do. Many experiments have been done where the particles are farther and farther and farther apart. And you, you wait until they're really far apart. You make a measurement of one of them. And then essentially simultaneously, just a short time later, 
you make a measurement of the other one, there's no way that traveling at the speed of light, any signal could have gone from the first one to the second one, telling it that a measurement had been made. And yet the other one knew that a measurement had been made and knew which way it had to spin in order to be self-consistent. That so is that, so crazy. It's totally crazy. It's called quantum entanglement, okay? It is totally <laughs> crazy sounding. And, you know, as, as Dick, Dick Feynman used to say, you know, relativity, if you think about it enough, it sort of becomes second nature. Even general relativity, if, if you think about big masses enough and big speeds and all that, it becomes second nature. But if you ever feel comfortable with quantum physics, it probably means you haven't thought about it sufficiently deeply. <laughs> and so he's the person crazy. of all the people I've ever met who had the deepest, most intuitive view of nature of, of anyone that I met. And he basically said, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you haven't thought about it enough. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Richard Feynman is a, a very interesting character. So as somebody that knew him, what, yeah. what was it in, in the things that he said or, or things that he discovered that made you and so many others say that this guy really had just an unusual intuitive understanding? Yeah, it, you know, it's just that he, he had this way of looking at things. He, he had a way of, of thinking about what nature is actually doing. And only later would he work out the mathematics. But the idea came first. And one of the best known examples of this are these things called Feynman diagrams, where he'd write down these little squiggles, little pictures showing the interactions of particles and then he made up equations that you have to apply every time, you know, a particle splits into two or whatever. But it almost looked like chicken scratches that were pretty arbitrary to his colleagues initially. But it was his way of thinking about the world. And then he developed it mathematically. And he could do on a chalkboard in half an hour a problem that using the tried and true brute force method might take 50 or 100 pages of very complex calculations. It would give the same answer, Whoa. you know, but in a much simpler way. So again, this goes back to what we were talking about where it turns out these are equivalent theories, but his way of looking at it was so different and so fresh that it looked like a completely different model, even though if you delve into it, and this is something that Freeman Dyson did, he showed that the different theories of, or the different formulations of what's called quantum electrodynamics, which discusses the electromagnetic interactions between protons and electrons in an atom, things like that. The three major theories that existed were basically equivalent, but looked very different. And Feynman's was by far the most intuitive. So it was this intuition about the world that struck me uh, as being quite astonishing. And you know, I, I knew him now close, well, basically 40 years ago now when I was a graduate student at Caltech. And in those 40 years since then, I've never met anyone who had that kind of advanced and very intuitive mental notion of how nature works. Yeah, there's something about him that certainly lasted. And, and from what I've heard, in very iconoclastic, sort of uh, bombastic personality. Uh, yeah. Sound like a, a pretty interesting guy. He, um, he, he was an interesting guy. He he had a very interesting personality. I mean, I, I, mean, I think one, one of the things that sort of irritated some of his Caltech fellow faculty is that, um, you know, he claimed not to like attention and stuff. But then he wrote all these books about his life and he, he kind of went out of his way to tell stories about himself with or without embellishment. I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't there to experience them firsthand. But they certainly seem quite amazing stories. And so if you don't want attention, why would you go around telling these stories about yourself? But, you know, I, I liked him a lot and I liked his stories. And the other thing that rubbed off on me from him was that he felt very strongly that if you can't explain something in a reasonably simple way to someone who does not have advanced knowledge of science and especially physics, then you probably don't understand it very well yourself. And that's one of the reasons I enjoy teaching the introductory astronomy class at Cal, 
I enjoy being in lots of science documentaries. I give a lot of public talks. I do these interviews and stuff because it gives me a chance to explain science to the general public. And often in the middle of the explanation, even some of the ones I've given you, Tom, I'll be totally honest, in my mind, I'm thinking once this is all done, I've got to go back and think about this some more because though I said the words, I'm not sure I really understand what those words mean, okay? I'll be no. perfectly honest. I, I get that. And I think that's really powerful that you do that. It's, you know, I'm sure a huge part of the reason that you're as good as you are is you don't just go, eh, I got away with it, you know? It's yeah. like you want to go and keep keep learning. I love that. Um, well, I, keep, keep learning. Keep uh, striving for a better understanding of the world. I mean, you, you mentioned that you'll never know death and blah, blah, blah. One of the things that most bothers me about death is that I'll never know what what ideas are raised and shown to be correct in the future. I'll, I'll never know what what ultimately becomes of human society, of, of the planet Earth, and, and so on. And I know that's the way it is, but it bothers me. Yeah, it, it bothers me because in my finite time, I want to learn as much as I can. And so I, I run a lot. I, I jog a lot. I know you're really into fitness and stuff. And so, you know, books on tape, podcasts, you know, Lex Friedman's thing, been listening to a lot of those, your things, books on tape, Audible. It's fantastic. Uh, I don't have read. that much time to sit and read. I do sometimes, but I have a lot more time in an hour a day to run and uh, walk and take hikes. And I listen to things at the time. So I'm continually learning. I am obsessed with that idea. Uh, it's what I call transitional moments. So it could be the gym. It could be brushing my teeth, walking from one place to another, cooking a meal. Um, I am always listening to a podcast or a YouTube video. In fact, oh my God, anybody, if you, if you have made it this far, let me tell you right now, you've got to check out Alex's great courses, which are phenomenal. Uh, amazing, man. The fact that people like you have taken the time to create these extraordinary classes and make them available. Uh, I feel like the age that we're living through where YouTube is available, like I know you will remember this, I remember this, having to go to the local university's library to do homework because there was no internet. Your family didn't have enough books to like even begin to scratch the surface. And the fact that now you can put the most random search into YouTube and somebody's got a video for you. And yeah. usually there's dozens or hundreds of videos. It's really extraordinary. It's an amazing educational opportunity. And as you say, there's a lot of free stuff online. You know, the great courses go on sale every once in a while, quite frequently, where they're just like a buck a lecture or something like that. It's, it's ridiculous. I don't know how they make any money, but whatever. That's their, that's their thing. You know, um, clearly they're very successful at it. But I did those courses as a way to further educate the public, not just UC Berkeley undergraduates. And those courses were done quite a number of them, you know, before all these YouTube free videos of various public lectures became available. Uh, so those are a great compliment. But for a course, you know, from step one to end, you get the full set of lectures that essentially I give here at Berkeley. That's mm. that's amazing. You know, oh, they're extraordinary. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So something I want to learn more about, I want to go back to quantum entanglement. Yeah. So if you had to guess or there must be theories, what's your favorite? What what do people think is happening? How is information traveling faster than the speed of light? Yeah. You know, honestly, we don't know, but there are a number of ideas. Um, one of the most crazy sounding, and I'm still trying to come to grips with it, is this thing that goes back nearly half a century. It's called the Everett or Everett and Wheeler Many Worlds Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics. This is different from the cosmological multiverse where we were talking about you know, little bubbles in some bigger hyperspace or, or a universe that's becoming so big that there are different little volumes within it that we can't communicate with but nevertheless exist. Those are all astronomical or cosmological multiverses. But there's a, a thing called the, the quantum multiverse. And the idea is, is that although these particles were a quantum superposition of spin up and spin down, and any particular measurement forced it to decide, so to speak, in anthropocentric terms, you know, up or down, 
there's some other universe where it was the opposite. And so in the many worlds interpretation, anytime you have a quantum superposition and then a measurement is made, there exists then, at least mathematically, in what's called Hilbert space, which is a mathematical space of all possible universes, those other possibilities exist. And I just said those words, and this is an example of me saying the words to you, but not truly understanding what the hell I'm talking about. Because I ask, you know, Sean Carroll and other people will, you know, and Sean is a big believer in this. He has a good podcast as well, by the way. Um, and I say, well, where the hell are these things? And he said, well, they're they're in this mathematical Hilbert space. And that just leaves me a little bit cold. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the guy who knows which end of the telescope to look through. You know, I'm a hands-on person. And I want to know where the hell all these universes are, okay? Um, so I'm trying to learn more about that and, and uh, come to better grips with it. But that's one idea, okay? And more and more quantum physicists are coming around to that, that there exist in some weird mathematical way, all these other universes. But another way of thinking about it is that, you know, once you made the measurement of one particle, you don't know that the other particle was spinning in the opposite direction until you come and talk to the experimental physicist who measured that other particle, mm. or you come and take a look at it yourself or something like that direct communication. But that had to be done at speeds less than or equal to the speed of light. So how do you know that the decision, the, the measurement in a, in a sense, isn't made when they come together to compare results? Now, the other guy can tell you, well, I, I made the measurement an hour ago, long before you came to visit me, and that's the way it was. But in some weird quantum mechanical entangled way, you know, something isn't reality until a measurement is made that two observers at the same place and the same time can agree upon, okay? So people can say stuff, but, but the measurement from the other person's perspective hasn't been made until they come together and compare results. So some people have been thinking about it that way. That we might others, just be confused that it's not yeah, actually yeah, traveling. Yeah. Yeah. And then others, I mean, I think Feynman would have said, we are stuck in our classical way of thinking. And even relativity is a classical theory. It's not a quantum theory. And there are many things in quantum theory that, in fact, violate your classical sensibility, right? It's just not the way the world works. Mr. Einstein, there is spooky action at a distance. I mean, you can call it that, you can call it spooky, but that's just the way the universe is. Mm. It's probabilistic, and it's not even that a set of particles exists in which each of them is a particular way, and you just don't happen to know which way it is. No, they are all a quantum superposition until a measurement is made. And, you know, you might think that in the end, this is all just, again, theoretical mumbo jumbo and intellectual titillation. And why should we pe pay people to think about this stuff? Well, you know, there's now this new area about which I know very little, just a little bit, you know, quantum computing, where instead of bits, ones and zeros, you have qubits. And you might have a three digit number, you know, one, zero, one, where instead of knowing what each of the digits was, a one or a zero or a one, you know some quantum probability distribution. That sounds like a lot less information, and it is. But it turns out that for certain types of calculations, you don't need to know the value of each of those bits. It's good enough to know the probability distribution, this quantum superposition, and you can do some types of calculations more quickly. So right now, people are only just barely working on these quantum, I mean, they're working hard. I said it wrong. But, you know, it's hard to keep these things cold and isolated from the environment, because as soon as you have some photon that interacts with it, you have what's called quantum decoherence, and mm. you no longer have the superposition. So there are big technical challenges. But one of the great things about Homo sapiens is that we embrace technical challenges 
we go for it. We climb the mountain because it's there. First, because it's interesting, but secondly, because it ends up having unanticipated spin-offs. And these quantum computers in 50 years may be the, the main way of computing at least certain types of problems, right? So you never know what the practical spin-offs will be of these wild-eyed, crazy-haired theories that, uh, that, you know, people that are incredibly creative um, and intelligent think of, you know? I think there's even even more to it than that. One thing that, so when I originally started making YouTube videos, it was like, all right, look, I know what my brand is gonna be. It's all around empowerment. I wanna help people manage sort of their mental state uh, because that had changed my life so extraordinarily when I got a grip on my own mind and saw that I was able to take myself so much farther. And then I was like, I, for my own sanity, I have to start branching out beyond that and in trying to explain to my team why I felt it was so important, it was you you get empowered so that you can do something. And you don't just get empowered to sit around empowered. It's like, just like skills have utility, you want to go put that utility to use. And getting people to, you, I study weird things that I never know how they're going to come to use in my life but they'll come to me as an analogy that makes something else make sense. They'll allow me to connect dots that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to connect. And so, you know, you're, unless you're, you just want to be a follower, you absolutely must encounter novel ideas outside of your, your realm of influence. And part of the reason that I think I've been ex as successful as I have been is that every 10 years, almost by accident, I've had to completely reinvent myself. And so I started out in film, then I went to technology, then I went to nutrition, and now I'm back in media, but media in a way that has changed in the intervening 20 years so radically as to be almost unrecognizable from where I started. And I heard this quote, and it, it literally to this day haunts me and is why I asked you that earlier question about staying sort of mentally supple, is genius is a young man's game. And I was just like, oh God, as somebody who's a late bloomer, I do not like that idea whatsoever. The fact that most people get the Nobel Prize in their 60s for work they did in their 20s, like yeah. I'm just, I'm not okay with that. And when you look, and I forget who said this, you might know, there was a guy, I think he's won two Nobel Prizes, could be wrong about that. But he said it was because he had, uh, I think chemistry and maybe physics, and he was like, it's the area of overlap that I have these two gigantic worlds and where they collide, I'm able to make novel insights that I wouldn't otherwise be able to make. And so that became sort of this rallying cry in my life of to have novel insights. I've just got to take in data that I can't yet predict how it's going to be useful. I follow my interests. It's not just sort of blindly taking in data. But in doing that, I find, whoa, like things collide that I couldn't have predicted. And your background in chemistry feels unaccidental to me that you would be as good at what you do as you are. Does, does that make sense to you? Yeah, you know, I have this background in chemistry from age 10 through 17. It was sort of all I did. And at the age of 14, I got a small telescope as a gift. And the third star I looked at turned out to be Saturn, you know, so that was a great thrill. No one you know, told me to look at that, that that would be Saturn. Uh, I discovered it on my own that night. Didn't matter that millions of people already knew about it. So that started me, uh, me off on astronomy on a steeper slope, but I always still liked chemistry and this whole exploration aspect of science as a whole. And now I, you know, I still study explosions, explosions of stars. I mean, I used to study explosions of chemical compounds and stuff, but they're all interrelated they have things that you can apply from one subject area to another, and they're useful if you keep your mind open. So I think my studies of chemistry and being interested in science in general were definitely helpful. But getting to another thing that you said there, you have this open mind, you've got these new ideas, you're setting a new course for yourself, as you did with you know, Quest Nutrition, for example but it was hard work. You had to put your butt down and work damn hard to get there, to grapple with new ways of doing things and stuff. And as physicists, as scientists, 
initially we come across these new ideas, quantum entanglement and all that, and you have to just struggle with them and work hard on them and approach them from different perspectives. It's not going to be easy, but, you know, good things are hard to do and hard things are good to do, right? You know, ultimately the satisfaction you get will be in some proportion, maybe even to some power of the effort and devotion you put into something. It's not going to come easily. And, you know, just last week, there was uh, this Hubble Space Del Telescope deadline. Every year you apply for time. And, you know, I had a bunch of proposals that I was on and a few that I was leading. And here it is. It's Thursday night. They're due on Friday. And, you know, I put in an all-nighter or nearly an all-nighter. And then I slept a lot the next day. Um, it's okay once in a while to do what is needed to be done to continue on. And I'm not saying get perpetually too little sleep, but I think it's been shown that if, if you skip a night once in a while and just get a lot of sleep the next night, that's okay. If you skip a week or two weeks, then you can't make up for it. But my point is simply that sometimes it's gonna be hard, but that's part of the reward. It's the sweat, it's the grit that you put into it. And you've done that, right? You reinvent yourself every 10 years. I'll bet it doesn't come naturally. If it does, more power to you. But I'm guessing that you have to put in the sweat, sweat, blood, and tears to do that. And scientists need to do that too. In, in all walks of life, to be a leader, you got to do what it takes sometimes. I agree. And this gets in. So I love your disclaimers about sleep. And I'm the same. You want to do things to make sure that you're around as long as possible. But I'd be lying if I said that I didn't find, I forget who the mathematician was, but there was this mathematician. And just for the record, I don't do drugs, but there was a mathematician who was notorious for doing speed. And um, one of his friends came to him and said, look, man, this is ridiculous. You're, you're going to end up killing yourself. You need to stop doing speed. And you're an addict. And he said, I'm not an addict. I could stop anytime. And the guy's like, all right, fine, do it. Stop for a month. And so he stops for a month. And at the end of the month, he, the friend says, you know, don't you feel better? And, um, you know, I am impressed that you were able to stop. And he was like, yeah, I told you I could stop, but we've just set mathematics back 10 years. And <laughs> that idea of being so obsessed with something that you really give yourself to it, because I am... I am well aware as I eat very cleanly, I prioritize sleep, I, my relationship with my wife is my number one priority, loving relationships, all of that, like so, so, so important. But at the same time, I'm shortening my life because of how fast and hard I go all the time, but I love it. And I make no apologies for it. And it is, uh, I forget the exact quote, but it's like, what I want to do with my life is help people find the thing that makes them come alive because what the world needs is more people who've come alive. And that like wanting other people to come alive in the way that you've come alive with astronomy and the way that it pushes you to, you know, pull an all nighter or to um, stay up all night watching to make sure the Lick Observatory didn't burn down during the fires. I mean, there's just like, I don't know, man. To me, that's like the beauty of it all. It's that same sense of poetry that I get when I look into the cosmos and, and just am horrified that I won't live long enough to see all the yep. answers and thrilled that I live in an age where we look up to the stars and have some context of what we're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, jumping off from what you said, it's yes, we all want to live a long time. And that's certainly my my uh, one of my goals. But uh, it's the quality of the time that you live that's actually more important than the duration. You know, if from age 70 to 100, you're, you're essentially a vegetable, okay? All right, you're alive, that, that's fine, but what quality of living are you getting from that, you know? So I'd rather live vigorously and get more out of the time when I'm conscious and my heart is beating and I'm doing things and enjoying nature and making discoveries, learning about other people's discoveries, I don't want to stagnate during those waking hours, you know, even if it means that I'll have fewer waking hours. But if you eat well, exercise and rest, and this is part of the message you give in so many of your presentations, you're likely also to, to live a long time, right? So and they're to not, have the energy to, yeah. to push. 
they're, they're not mutually exclusive here. Now, you know, when I was young, I was kind of a maniac. I really did get way too little sleep. I now acknowledge that it was probably bad for me in the long run. Fortunately, right now, I'm still very, very healthy and um, don't seem to have suffered any clear side effects from my maniacal youth. But I, I was crazy um, as, a, as a student and a postdoc and an or, you know, assistant professor. I mean, I just, I worked all the time and it's, be, it's in part because I loved it. I mean, it was mostly because I loved it. Sure, I wanted to get a job and all that, but I wasn't really worried about that because, you know, if I work hard and produce good results, the job will come with it. But it was because I loved it so much and still do love it that I have to stop myself some evenings and say, look, Alex, it's time to get some sleep. You know, you can start again the next day. But often my mind is racing with the things that I've read or thought about, and it can be hard to fall asleep. That's my problem, actually. When I get enough sleep, it's hard for me to fall asleep at an early enough time to then not have to, for example, turn on or set an alarm clock. And I know that you don't like to set alarm clocks, and I confess that I can't exist that way because I, <laughs> <laughs> I would end up you know, falling asleep too late and then sleeping through my morning appointments or my classes or whatever. You yeah, know? no, I definitely get, I that. definitely get that. So let me ask you, if you could either look into the future, a, a number of years to your uh, discretion or into the past to whatever period you want to look to, which would you choose? Oh gosh, I would look toward the future. How no far question. would you go? Yeah. You know, and uh, I'll just first, first the future because we do have ways of examining the past. That's one of the great things about science. You know, geologists study the strata in the Grand Canyon. Astronomers look at progressively more distant galaxies and thus they're looking back in time, a time machine. By the way, this is one of the things that I try to teach my introductory class, besides we are made of star stuff. By looking farther back in distance, we we are looking further back in time. So there are many ways of recreating what happened and learning, not the details, but, you know, archaeologists, they look at they look at ancient societies and stuff. So we already know a fair amount about the past, and that's thrilling. But I really want to know about the future. What in particular is going to happen to humanity? Hmm. Are we going to be stuck on this planet? And is something going to go drastically wrong because an unanticipated asteroid hits us? or we're neglectful of earth um, or don't, you know, and don't recognize what we're doing to it. Or there's some megalomaniac who just says, well, I'm going down. So everyone's going down with me, you know, whatever, some human induced disaster or some extraterrestrial disaster that wipes out life on earth. Is that what's going to happen? Will we be elsewhere before that happens, spreading our seed elsewhere, et cetera? I want to know what happens to us, to humans, not just to the universe. I think the universe will expand forever, but, uh, you know, and eventually stars will die out. But I'm deeply interested in plants and animals and in particular humans on Earth. What's going to happen to us? And is that 100 years in the future? A millennium? I hope not such short time scales, though they might be. I'm hoping it's millions of years if not tens or hundreds of millions of years. So if you got granted access to one moment in the future, but you had to pick a specific number of years in the future, how many number of years would you pick? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, You know, a million years is a little bit silly because it it would be almost like probably things would be completely unrecognizable. Uh, or maybe we wouldn't even be here. Maybe we'd be completely replaced by robots. I don't know. Uh, 10 years is way too little. Even 100 is a bit too little. So in round order of magnitude, you know, factors of 10, I would say 1,000 years would be really interesting. In 3000 BCE, uh, sorry, CE, <laughs> I was putting myself 5,000 years ago, but in 3000 CE, what will life be like and what will humans be like here on earth? And will we have progressed elsewhere? I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of space travel and exploration mm. in part because we're pioneers, explorers by nature, in part because 
to improve our chances of survival, we really do need to put us elsewhere. And in part because it's such a giant technological challenge and I like challenges and humans are good at, at you know, addressing and meeting challenges. And space exploration I think is inspiring to the kids as well. So it helps them, motivate them to go into STEM fields, you know, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and most of them won't become rocket scientists, but that's okay. They'll go on into fields that are more immediately useful to society. Medical physics, applied physics, engineering, computer science, all, all these things are good reasons to do space exploration. So how far will we have gotten in a thousand years, mm. you know? How far do you think, so barring the sort of cataclysmic human error of some kind, uh, how far do you think we get in a thousand years? I think in a hundred years we'll be on Mars. Um, maybe not a gigantic colony. I know Elon Musk is, I think in January 2020, he said a million people by 2050. I don't think that's going to happen. He said one person by 2026. Whoa. He said this only a year and a bit ago. And he said an uncrewed spacecraft by 2024. You know, I, I don't think those things are going to happen, but it's great to be ambitious like Elon is, right? He motivates people. He gets them inspired. So what if you don't meet your timeline? At least it gets people pumped up. So he's, his timeline is gradually being revised. We'll see what he says when we get close to 20s, 26, and there isn't a person on Mars yet. But sometime in the 2030s, there might be a person on Mars by 2100, we might have a small colony in a dome. I think it's very difficult to terraform Mars. Not completely impossible, but there are big issues. Uh, but we might, you know, build domes or something. So the point is have at least some of us somewhere else so that in case something happens on Earth bad, we are elsewhere. And I'm not saying, I'm not using this as an excuse. Some people are sometimes critical of this line of reasoning that, oh, you're using this in, as an excuse not to take good care of Earth. No, I want to take good care of Earth the best that we possibly can. But we hedge our bets, right, by placing some eggs in a different basket, folks. Mm. Things could go wrong no matter how well we think we're looking after Earth. Um, you know, so it just makes sense to put us elsewhere. And of course, we want to respect any indigenous life that is elsewhere. But I think the odds of Mars having anything beyond bacteria are remote. And even the bacteria are not a high probability, in my opinion. So I think that will be, you know, land that we're not taking from anyone or anything. So why not basically spread Homo sapiens? Yeah, I am I am aggressively on board with that. And I think that, you know, one thing people maybe aren't thinking through is that when people started going west, it's not like the cities crumbled and nobody cared about them. The vast majority of humanity is going to stay here. And even if all the people that left didn't care, which of course I think they would, I think they would care maybe more. Like there's something about it's still being the homeland, the people that you love, that you're leaving behind. You never want anything to happen to it. Um, but that no matter how good, beautiful a city gets, people have always ventured into the unknown. And like you said, it's so inspiring to people. Um, so I am wildly motivated by space travel, even though I agree that, you know, it's like protect Earth first. That's, you know, the only logical sort of self-preserving way to think about it. Um, but there's something about feeling like you can go beyond and, I mean, I'll use a word that people are going to hate, but you you go and you conquer, like you, you put yourself at tremendous risk. I mean, think about the Polynesians as they set out onto the ocean. Like, that's so crazy. When you see the boats that they got in and found a way to find these like crazy tiny islands and the sort of awe that I think about those journeys, I think about a space journey. I mean, it's so exciting to me. Oh, yeah. And you know, how many failed Polynesian expeditions were there where they didn't come across Hawaii or one of the South Sea Islands or whatever? Yeah. But they were explorers, right? And I, I feel the same way. 
It's going to be hard though, and there's going to be some failures. But we yeah, are I'll be explorers. You know. Do you think yeah. we'll have the stomach for that when the first uh, people on Mars end up dying on Mars? Will yeah. we have the stomach to send more people? Oh, oh, I think so. Um, you know, the government has to be very, very careful because if someone dies, it's a big PR disaster and all that. In the private enterprise, it's not that way. You get people who want to go, who understand the risks. Um, there isn't the government responsibility and that you're using taxpayer dollars and, oh, you know, suddenly a teacher died like in the Challenger disaster. That was mm -hmm. that was horrible. I mean, it was a you know, it was just a tremendous loss. Um, you know, I understand they had reasons for wanting her to go, but, but you know, she wasn't a trained astronaut who had agreed that these are the risks that that profession is going to entail. You know, I'm sure she understood that uh, it was a dangerous mission, but there hadn't been a failure up to then. Mm -hmm. So we were pretty good. And so maybe we even became a little bit complacent, right, about what our success rate will be. But that was a dangerous thing, right? And it was a publicly funded thing. It was NASA. But in the private domain, I think it's a different story. First, you can do things cheaper and faster. Secondly, you can recruit people who, at least initially, let's say, they plan on dying there. Maybe they have even a terminal disease. They don't even plan on coming back. But the thrill of being among the first people on Mars, you know, if I didn't have my family to, to think about, and I do, you know, I sometimes have asked this hypothetical question. If I had a terminal disease and if I had very little to live a year, just enough time to get to Mars, would I go there, you know, just, just, just for the thrill of the experience? And I know that my family wouldn't like it, and so I probably <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't do it. But, you know, just between you and me and all the people who are going to listen to this, yeah, it's, a, it's something I've thought about. Not that it's a possibility right now, and not that I hope I get a terminal disease. But initially, it's going to be people who, are, uh, who know that they're not going to come back, because bringing someone back is even more difficult than just landing them there. Uh, and landing them there is a lot more difficult than just landing robots there because you don't need to deal with oxygen and waste and water and food. And if some robots, you know, get destroyed in an explosion or a failed landing, well, all right, so what? At least it's not human lives. But as long as people understand the risks that are that are that they're taking, yeah, I think there will be such people. And indeed, I think there, there's some Mars One company or something like that that already has a list of people that they have who are saying, yeah, we'll go on a one-way journey. And we understand the risks. Do you know Ernest Shackleton and the uh, Endurance? Yeah. Have you ever read the ad that he put in the paper to get his crew? I, ha I either have not read the ad or I don't remember it. Please remind oh me. Oh my God, it is so good. I, uh, I had to look it up the other day and read it to my wife because I'm like, you wanna hear the kind of people I wanna be around? It, uh, I don't have it memorized, but it goes something like this. Looking for um, men who are interested in a job that will entail, entail bitter cold, low wages, extremely uh, difficult terrain, almost certain failure, unlikely to make it home alive, but glory and something else if we're successful. And that was it. And he crewed up, man. People were ready. They, they, yeah. were, they wanted that challenge. They wanted the shot at glory. And you can say that people are foolish for wanting it, man, but there's something in the human spirit that there is a subset of people who were just like, sign me up. And, uh, oh man, I, I find that really inspiring. Yeah. Well, you know, so, so Mars, I think is a very real possibility and there will be people who, who want to go and a colony might get set up in some sort of a dome with air in it. There's already practice being done. There's some place in Arizona where they basically isolate themselves for a year or two inside a dome Whoa. biosphere, I think it's called. Yeah. Practice living under such conditions. Um, you know, elsewhere in our solar system becomes more difficult, although not impossible. But ultimately, given that even our sun is gradually growing more powerful, and you know that's not the cause of the current climate change, but ultimately it will. In a billion or two billion years, the oceans will have evaporated away. Um, that could be compensated by 
a lowering of the carbon dioxide level by a substantial amount, but that then makes plants angry, okay, if you lower the carbon dioxide level too much. So within about one or two billion years, conditions will be fairly unlivable here on Earth. Now that's a pretty long time scale. Nevertheless, if humans or their evolutionary descendants live that long, we have no choice but to either, either move our planet farther away or go to Mars or whatever, but even those are temporary solutions. We've got to go to other planetary systems. And there, I think it's much, much harder because, you know, the nearest star, it takes light four and a quarter years to travel. It's 4.2 light years away. That's 25 million, million miles. Okay, it's, it's an unfathomable number, right? It's, and that's uh, the close one. Yeah, it's the closest one, right? In my, you know, to give you an, an example of one of the analogies I use in my class, suppose our sun, which is 109 Earths across. So the sun is big, okay? Squish the sun down to a grain of sand and then scale all other distances by about, by, by the same factor, okay? So on a scale where stars are grains of sand, the nearest star is about 10 miles away. Whoa. Okay, yeah. Stars are grains of sand and they're spaced 10 miles apart from one another or 10 kilometers. It doesn't really matter. We're just order of magnitude right. here. So these are gigantic distances. And so though I'd like humans, homo sapiens, to get to planets that we know are orbiting other stars and astronomers are even finding ones that more or less live in the region where water might exist on the surface in liquid form and all that, the so-called Goldilocks planets. Let's say we find one and we wanna go there. It's not gonna happen with humans because of the length of time it takes to get there or the inordinate amount of energy to get spacecraft up to a very fast speed. It could be done with frozen embryos or something with some future technology maybe, but even there, the embryos are frozen, but there are still all these charged particles called cosmic rays that will interact with them, cause cells to, you know, DNA to mutate and stuff, and usually mutations don't have good consequences. So a, a better way than with flesh and blood is to send robots that could then, you know, fix themselves if some charged particle messes up part of the circuitry. And then using the raw materials on the planet, they could build copies. So our evolutionary descendants could well be robots, and if that is very distasteful to you, I could also imagine where the robots are there on another planet, you sent them there, but then you send human genetic code as a bunch of ones and zeros using a radio signal, which travels at the speed of light, and the robots get that genetic code, and then they could create humans. That would be a way of getting That's flesh and blood over there. Yeah, without actually physically sending the flesh and blood. You that is really interesting. So, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. I, I could send a robot there and then send my own genetic information? Like yeah. me personally. This would basically be a clone of me? Yeah, yeah. So, you assume the robots are already there. It took a long time to get them there. Okay. Yep. Some future generation, the robots are there. And now you say, I, Tom, want a clone of myself on this other planet orbiting a star, you know, four light years away. You encode your whole genetic code, but you know, as a bunch of ones and zeros, right? And you send that information as a radio signal, radio waves travel at the speed of light. Four and a quarter years later, that signal with your genetic code reaches that planet. The, pro the robots have been programmed to receive, so-called, right? Like the, the eagles thing, we are programmed to receive, right? but they are programmed to receive and they then build a copy of you. I mean, that, that's not possible right now, sure. but I don't see anything uh, that violates any known laws of physics. That's always my standard. Does it violate any known laws of physics? If it doesn't, let's consider it. If it does, well, maybe there's a way to circumvent that, but that's a lot more speculative. But this is not that crazy, you know? I like that idea a lot. So I'm writing a story right now 
about, um, it's called Coyotes of the Air Gap. And it's all about basically a future in which people's consciousness are uploaded into these great clusters of servers, kind of like the matrix, but imagine if you were aware, like when you died, you, you know, upload your consciousness and uh, your consciousness carries on, you have all your memories, but you know that you're a digital entity. And if we actually get to the point, and I know that we're a long way away from it, but if we actually got to the point where we could upload our consciousness, then that means that I could send my consciousness somewhere, have it sort of essentially re-downloaded into either a purely robotic body or a sort of combination genetics robot or genetics entirely um, created by the, the robots. Man, that's so interesting to me as somebody that, so I don't have kids, so there's no, um, I don't know if catharsis is the right word, but there's no like that, that sense of sort of denial of death and that I have children that will carry on my legacy. So I think a lot about how do I get my consciousness at least, uh, you know, to live on. So that that's oh, really interesting. Yeah. It makes me want to write a story around that. No, it's totally fascinating, Tom. And if you're not hell bent on having, you know, a, a physical copy of yourself, if that's not so important, if what's going on your, in your mind is the most important thing, then indeed, uh, essentially storing the contents of the brain as a bunch of ones and zeros. It's a, it's a lot of them. Okay. <laughs> and all that. We don't even really know what consciousness is, but you'd want to reproduce everything, right? You'd want to reproduce, not just sentience, but consciousness and empathy and, and feelings of, of love and desire and pain and all that, not just a nervous nerve pain, but you know, a, an emotional pain. Mm. If you want all those things, it's going to be a lot of bits. Nevertheless, if what we are is a bunch of ones and zeros, and I don't know that we know the answer to that question yet, but I actually, you know, I think that's what we are. We're a very interesting set of ones and zeros. Nevertheless, it's a ones and zeros. Then, yeah, a way to immortality might be to store the contents of your brain every five minutes or every hour or whatever somewhere else and even beam it to another planet even, but you know, it could be in some cloud storage, so to speak, right? And then if you get run over by a truck, it gets downloaded to either a new person, but not a person, probably a, you know, a computer or a robot. Mm. But again, if it's your if it's your mind that you find most important and you don't really need your body, then you're just some, you know, you're just a, a, a robot there. You're just a computer, but you're having many of the same thoughts, okay? Uh, not, not all of them, because of course you, you don't have the same physical interaction as when you have, mm -hmm. you know, hug someone or, or make love or whatever, right? But at least the thinking part of you where you're thinking your abstract thoughts and trying to explore the world and thinking about quantum entanglement, all that could continue. And your memories of what you did as a kid and what you did in your career, they're all stored in that computer. And so, so in that sense, you've bought yourself immortality, right? I mean, I, I find it depressing when I forget things because a big part of me is my memories. Mm. And when I forget things, it's like part of me is lost. And I guess I'm not aware of it unless someone brings up the subject whose memory I've forgotten. But Sometimes I get together with my old grad school buddies and they'll bring up something. And I'm all, oh man, I had totally forgotten that we did this or that 40 years ago, you know? And here you'd have them all at your disposal. Maybe it would be an information memory overload. I don't know. You know, maybe yeah, it would be a bad thing. You know? It's interesting to think about what, what makes us human. What would humans need to put into the robots in order to feel that, whatever we value about the human race has lived on. Because even as you're describing, it's like, yeah, man, they're part of what makes us us is the pruning. It is the fact that our memories are malleable, right? And we wouldn't right. recognize a human experience the way that a robot or a hard drive is, is literal. Like these yeah. are the ones and zeros that you've laid down. They will be those ones and zeros every time you access them. And part of what makes humans so interesting is the malleability of our memory, is the way I just had a sleep doctor on, of all people, who was talking about how one of the fundamental reasons that we sleep is that we're taking that experience from the day and we're sort of wiping off all the hard 
emotional resonance and then putting the memory back as sort of knowledge without the pain. And so we said yeah. a better way to think of it is time doesn't heal all wounds. Sleep heals all wounds. Yeah. And to the, the notion of, well, if you have a hypothesis, it should make predictions. One of the predictions is that there should be in people that have PTSD where sleeping doesn't seem to um, reduce the emotional stress, you should be able to measure that in their blood. And you can. And it's the amount of noradrenaline should go down at night. For people with PTSD, it doesn't. And so it stays elevated. And so they found that if you give them, there's this heart medication drug that has this bizarre side effect of it lowers the noradrenaline in your brain. If you yeah. give them that, their PTSD goes away. It's really, yeah. really interesting. Just I, I bring that up in the context of where's that line for humans? You know what I mean? Does it have to be me? Like you need to ship me, my, my meat suit to another planet? Right. Is it just my mind? But so yeah. much. Um, Lisa Feldman Barrett wrote a book called How Memories Are Made or How Emotions Are Made. And she talks about how without your body, you, you literally wouldn't be able to make sense of your world. And because there's this two-way communication between the body and the mind, anyway, so interesting to me. Yeah. You know, uh, on this topic, a bit of a tangent, but not completely. You know, you, you emphasize sleep and memories and emotions and all that. Another thing I find that really makes my life full and that accentuates memory, memories and the process of living and all that is to occasionally go through mind-blowing experiences. And I have here a shirt that my wife, wife helped design. It's of a total solar eclipse. It was August 21st, 2017. We were in Oregon. But if you've never seen a totally eclipsed sun where the moon blocks all of it, all of the bright disk, it is a mind-altering, highly moving, emotional experience that you will never forget and that can keep you going sometimes in, in low times or whatever. I don't know, Tom, have you ever seen one of these phenomena? A total I, solar eclipse? I saw a partial eclipse and that okay. was awesome. Well, so... that's awesome, but you haven't lived, Tom, despite your very full life. April 8th, 2024, the path of a total solar eclipse goes right across the US, goes through Mexico, enters Texas, goes up to the Northeast, uh, New York and into uh, north uh, into Eastern Canada, April 8th, 2024, put it on your calendar, be on the path of totality. You might be at 90%, 95%, 98% eclipse, but it's not the same. Mm. It's more than a night and day experience, Tom. You got to be within the path, you know, call me or write to me after you've experienced it. You will be a transformed person. And you will look back to that date and time and that experience throughout the remainder of your life as wow. one of these things that you're glad you put on your bucket list and did experience. And it didn't cost very much to do so. I mean, the path goes right through Dallas, Texas, and a bunch of other cities. Usually these things are in the distant corners of the world. And it's a great way to travel, by the way, if you have the time and means to do so. Uh, as my wife and I have been doing, I've done 17 of these things, but this one is going to be really easy for Americans to see. April 8th, 2024. Tom, don't miss it. You'll thank me. Have you ever had to put words to why it's so moving? It's difficult to put words because it's such an out of body, out of mind experience. Your jaw just drops when the last bit of the sun gets covered. You get this thing called the diamond ring effect right at the beginning of totality and right at the end. That's a magical moment. Then you look at the total eclipse and you see this corona surrounding what looks like a black hole in the sky. And it's just hanging there and you're all like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so it's your mind turns to mush. Many people who try to photograph it, you know, if, unless they have their sequence practiced many times, they'll flub up. Better to have a computer running it because you don't want to be messing around and distracted by that. Mm. Plus the photographs and even the videos don't show the whole experience. It's the, the temperature changing, the light changing very quickly, the corona coming out, the people reactions. It's a very social experience for some. Others want to experience it privately, whatever your thing is. The whole thing is just marvelous and quite indescribable in work. I mean, I now I know I sound like a nut, you can call me a lunatic. That's a bit of a joke, right? Nice. 
once you've seen one, you will see why those of us who have been there talk in such nonsensical terms about experiencing a total solar eclipse. All so right. yeah. I'll definitely check it out. April now, 8th, do, 2024. Do you think that there are other beings in the universe that have a similar um, take? Like, is, is there any human-like alien out in the world, out in the universe, I should you say? You know, maybe, maybe. Um, the universe is a big place. And uh, within our observable universe, there's something like 10, uh, sorry, like something like 100 billion galaxies, um, even more if you count the little ones. Each galaxy has billions of stars. Ours has more than 100 billion stars. So when you, you know, multiply all the numbers together, there are a lot of stars, there are a lot of planets, a lot of them are potentially habitable. The thing is though, that we don't know how life came about, and we don't know how it evolved to intelligence at our level. And at least on Earth, it was a very unlikely process. Throughout most of the history of Earth, in fact, it didn't happen. You know, Homo sapiens were around starting 250,000 years ago, early hominids four million years ago. Out of the near four billion year history of life on Earth, there hasn't been anything like us and moreover, intelligence and mechanical ability at our level is not a clear evolutionary advantage. So for those reasons and some others, I think that life as advanced as ours is out there, but not very common. Mm. And that might be a minority view, but I, I think I have good reasons for thinking that. Um, you can't just say there are a lot of stars out there and surely they're teeming with life. There are a lot of factors that lead to life and then intelligence and mechanical ability at our level. And I think they're fairly rare. I don't think we're unique, but I think they're pretty rare, at least yeah. in our galaxy, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the Fermi paradox certainly introduces the idea of, well, if they are there, where are they? Like, why are they so yeah. quiet? Right. If, if, if they're really common, then we should have seen them in abundance. The Fermi paradox does not explain things if they're if they exist but are not very common. Then then you can explain the Fermi paradox. So I'm not using it to argue completely against the existence of other things. And plus, uh, again, I think a natural evolutionary process does, given enough time and circumstance, lead to things like us. I just don't think it's a very common process. You mm -hmm. know. Yeah. One, one of my favorite statements about the universe is, uh, and I unfortunately don't know who said it, but um, if you bombard a planet with photons long enough, it will emit a Tesla. And uh, I thought that was hilarious uh, since that is precisely what happened here on Earth. Um, well, the monkey's typing uh, on typewriters and coming out with Romeo and Juliet, right? So true. Yeah. It's uh, when you were when you were describing the solar eclipse, it just that notion of the the wonderment of what the universe has created in in us, you know, that we are star stuff thinking about the very nature of stars and 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 being awed by it. Isn't that magical? Yeah, very. Right. And, and to be awed by an eclipse. And by the way, other planets in our own solar system don't have moons that have the right size and distance from the planet to give you as nice an, an eclipse as what we have. So, mm. you know, we're privileged to have it. We are able with our minds to enjoy it and appreciate it. You know, whales and dolphins are pretty intelligent, but I don't know that any experiments ever have ever been done to see whether they appreciate the awe and the beauty of something like an eclipse or even of their own existence, right? Do they tangibly understand that they exist and the intricacies of evolution that led to their being? We do. And that's part of what makes Homo sapiens so special, right? And I'm not denigrating whales and dolphins in any way. I'm just saying that as far as we can tell, our minds and the way they work and the emotions we have not to say that a dog can't experience sadness. It can, okay? But again, we are at a level that's really quite extraordinary. 
even considering the tens of billions of other species that have lived on Earth, you know, there's nothing quite like humans other than the apes, but we are descended from the apes and, you know, we're just farther along that sequence. And it's it's magical and marvelous and each of us should do what we can to get m the most out of this life that we've been given, you know, in our own way. All right. Well, for people that want to take you up on that and get the most out of their life, where can they connect with you? Yeah. So my wife is just starting up um, a website called astronomy.club. I will have, um, you know, things like celestial sites that are coming up, eclipses, things like that. Uh, you can ask me a question every once in a while. Um, I'll post links to various public talks and things that I've given. So we're just starting up. We hope to have it running soon. We will by the time this um, this uh, interview appears. So you can you can reach me there. And then, of course, if you just Google my name or whatever your favorite search engine is, there are a lot of uh, public talks that that are on the Internet. And then, of course, there are the great courses. It's a company that that sells these courses. I did a big introductory course with them. I'm hoping to do a what's new in astronomy course sometime in the next few years with them. Um, and then I have a, an introductory astronomy textbook through Cambridge University Press, the Cosmos. So I think we'll have links to all those things on the astronomy.club website. And oh, um, oh. so I hope to see some of your followers there, uh, Tom. And thank you for the privilege and honor of talking with you. Man, thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed my time. This was a lot of fun. And guys, speaking of things that are a lot of fun, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care.